morning chat. <laughs> Sorry, have I, have I missed something? Have I missed something? Sorry, I was I had you guys on mute. Oh, so whatever great. you have been talking about, I have not heard. Everyone's saying that I was too chirpy, and I was like, I'll talk more like this to be like, oh, dear. <laughs> Is that how I speak, Suki? Well, I couldn't get as deep as your voice. That's not the answer to the question. Is that how I speak? Oh, you get... It's close, close. <laughs> Why don't you try speaking like her, Oti? <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine? Could you imagine? Good morning, guys. Everyone's obviously in good spirits today. Yes. It must be the new um, lockdown that's keeping everybody chirpy and cheerful. Good to hear. Good to hear and see. And we're just about to get started. January the 9th, 2021. Can you believe it? No. Hmm. Who do we have? We have Mr. Communications Officer. Good morning and happy Sabbath. We have Brother Monty Reed, Elder Herbert Griffiths. Brother Clarence Crosdale minus we're missing a Crosdale. Um, we'll see a Crosdale. We'll be, we'll be in a minute. Good morning and happy Sabbath, brother and sister, or should it be sister and brother Macintosh? Good morning <laughs> and happy Sabbath. Sister Berry, how are you? Happy Sabbath to you. Sister Brown, good day, happy Sabbath. Hiding Angela, Sister Scarlett. Elder Lawrence, Sister Mal, the Taddy family, and our absent Sister Crosdale. Oh, Who's missing? Who's missing a uh, a Bev cuddle on a Sabbath morning? A Bev cuddle? Huh? Yeah. Well, Who's I, missing I, a cuddle I, uh... from Sister Bev? I know that you maybe are. <laughs> I'm, I'm missing a cuddle from Sister Bev, uh -huh. and. I look forward to the day when I can receive one of those again. Oh, There's some things that you take for granted, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, let's pray and let's begin our service today. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are grateful. We're grateful to you because we recognize that you are the sustainer of our lives. You are the reason that we are able to be here, Lord, to worship you. And Lord, I just want to say thank you for everything that you do, everything that you have done and what you are still yet to do. Lord, we are opening this time up to you to be led by your Holy Spirit. Father, of our own accord, of our own, Lord, we have nothing of any true value to bring or to offer. So we are asking, Father, that you would lead, that you would guide, that you would speak to us, and that you would bring the increase in our hearts and in our lives. Lord, may we say and do things today which are to your name's honor and glory. And Lord, may I'm opening this time to you as a, a time where you can take it, Lord, and use it to deliver a message to our hearts. Speak to us, Father. Help us to reform our lives, to bring them closer into the likeness of Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Lord, because we know that this is your will above even our own. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Welcome. Welcome, one and all. And we're going to begin by singing one of my very, very favorite hymns. Three, four, one, to God be the glory. Reason. 
Sister Beth, happy Sabbath, good to see you. Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 10 reads in my version, the King James, fear not, fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness, says the Lord. Amen. Um, the, at this time, I just want to introduce the lesson, but less the lesson and the speaker, less the lesson, more the speaker. So I'm down. I was down to teach the lesson this morning, um, and then I was asked to preach this afternoon. And let's be honest, there's only a certain amount of Otis that anyone, any one of us can handle in any given day, myself included. And so I have. Um, enlisted the help of a of a guest teacher this morning, which I'm sure will be a blessing to us all. Our guest teacher hails all the way from um, Wolverhampton via rugby, via India. She'll be familiar to all of you. Her name is Sukhvinder Kaur Carey. She hates when I call her Sukhvinder, but that is her name. I'm not making it up, that is her name. And so we will be favored this morning and Suk Suki will be taking the lesson for us. Over to you, my dear. Brother, brother, um, brother Otis, before uh, I disturb Suki, um, the breakout room is open for the youth. We start in the youth class today. So any youths who wish to join, please um, enter the youth class in the breakout room. Fantastic, excellent, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Over to you, Sophie. Thank please, you. Please, please, can you wrap up around about ten to the hour? Yeah, no problem. So, good morning, everybody. Happy Sabbath. Um, what a privilege it is to be learning with you and teaching you today. So, my style of class is less telly and more interactive. So, please have your Bibles at the ready ready to flip and turn. I'm going to be asking you to engage and talk to me rather than let me talk to you. Um, and I'm hoping that our lesson this week will be an opportunity for us to learn together. Um, before we do that, I just want to say a super quick prayer before we go into this section of study, if that's okay. So let's pray together. Dear Father in heaven, just want to thank you for the opportunity to study your word and your message for this week. Father, the lesson has so many rich messages for us to take away, especially in these troubling times. So Father, we just ask that you will reside over our lesson, plant a seed in our heart of understanding, and we pray that you will bless our knowledge and our experience in this lesson today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So the lesson today, well, this week for me was almost two lessons. It was like a lesson within a lesson. So I'm hoping that we have all had a chance to study it. I'm not going to read the lesson to you, but I want us to talk about what the title crisis of leadership means and why it's pertinent to this week's lesson. So um, as a HR professional, when I first read the lesson, it spoke to me in so many ways, because not only could I see 
um, the effects of uh, what poor leadership does in our world and in our work today, but also where we are right now in historical times with the pandemic, political issues, what's coming out of America, all these things. I'm thinking we are in the very midst, we're seeing these crises unfold around us around the globe. What I would like us to do is have, first of all, let's have a read of our memory text, which is now taken from Isaiah chapter six, verse one. And it tells us in the year that King Uzziah, otherwise known as Azariah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up and the train of his robe filled the temple. Now, who can tell me who King Uzziah or Azariah was? What did we learn about him in this week's lesson? Feel free to shout out anything you might know. If those of you that don't know haven't had a chance to do the lesson this week, you'll find all the answers in 2 Chronicles chapter 26. So if you have a little skim through there, you'll find out a little bit about who King Uzziah was. So... Second Chronicles chapter 26 will tell us a bit about him. Any idea about the kind of king that he was or who he was? He was very young, relatively. Yeah, he was 16 when he took the throne. How long was he reigning for? 52 years. Yeah, and you know what? That is very, very impressive. So we think about our current reigning monarch. She's reigned for 65 years or 65 years, I think it is. Um, and that is the longest reigning monarch in British history, 52 years. Can you imagine having a prime minister for 52 years? Oh, no. I mean, the queen, let's be honest, she doesn't really do that much, but imagine having a ruling government for 52 years. So yes, he was relatively young when he took the throne. What else do we know about him? He, he, he um, was involved with a, a number of wars, battles. Yeah, but... What's interesting is that we see that in those wars, in those conflicts, he didn't actually have to do that much fighting because we see that God was on his side. God favored King Uzziah in his early reign. What kind of king was he? Specifically looking at chapter 26 verses one to five in Second Chronicles, we'll learn a bit more um, about the kind of king that he was. Um, it's interesting, um, given the age he started at, um, when you get as an adult, they always say, behind any good man is a good woman. <laughs> yeah. And in this case, it was interesting that the passage mentions his mother. Okay. By name. Okay. Okay. Um, which suggests to me that obviously she had some guidance, was giving him some kind of guidance, even if it was unofficial in terms of the, the role he was having to take up at such an early age. Yeah, definitely. It's important to have a good entourage and counsel, especially when you're young. And, you know, he stepped up to the plate, 16 is an awfully young age. He stepped up to the plate, took on the responsibility. And we can see in verse four of chapter 26 of Second Chronicles that he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that his own father Amaziah, Amaziah had done. Sorry if that pronunciation is not right. Um, in verse five, we see he set himself to seek God in the days of Zechariah, who instructed him in the fear of God. And interestingly, the next, the next part of the verse says, and as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. When we consider those words, as long as, what does that, what's that preempting? Mm. What is that, what is that, what spoiler alert is that giving you? Eventually he turned his eyes away from God. Exactly. So we see that in his early days, he was a passionate ruler. He was enthusiastic. He was committed. And, you know, interestingly, when we read the Bible about the kind of reign that he had, I kind of feel like I would want to live in the times when he was king. He was very innovative. He was cutting edge. He had machines. He had devices. He created uh, an economy that was the second most prosperous after Solomon. 
So we, these were exciting times to live in. And thinking about Isaiah, which is where our Bible text and our lesson is taken from this week, he was a prophet alive and witnessing these days of Isaiah. So he went from being a super prosperous, super um, innovative and uh, loved ruler. And then we learn about his downfall. So yes, we learn about the wars and that, that God fought on his half. And then when we read down to uh, verse 16, um, which in my Bible is entitled Uzziah's pride and punishment, which I think is a very clear understanding of uh, what's about to happen. What do we learn about what did um, King Uzziah do? Yes, that's right, Sister Jean. What did he do? Um, went into the went into the, um, the temple to offer. He burned up of in, incense. Exactly. He went in to go and burn incense. Now we know from Leviticus, Deuteronomy. We know from the way in which um, God set the template of what the sanctuary was going to look like that no one could go into the most holy place for fear of what. What would happen to them if they went into the most holy? Death. They die. So much so the priest used to have a little bell on his ankle when he went in the Day of Atonement because it, for fear of him dropping dead. You know, so this king's brave. He has got pride. You know, Proverbs tell us what comes before pride. Or what comes before a fall? Sorry, I've just given you the answer. What comes before a fall? <laughs> pride. Yeah. Pride yeah. comes before a fall. No, and you know. Pressure. Question, did he go into the most holy place? No. He went into the holy of holies. No, he went to no. the holy place. Holy place. He went into the holy place. Yeah. But even going into the holy place, was that permitted or not permitted? Not for him. And what did God, what was God's response? Leprosy. Yes, but first of all, what was God's response before even the leprosy struck? Who went in to appease him? Well, what was happening that he had 82 or 83 priests who were stopping him? So, yeah, he had 80 priests as well as the host. So, I think it was 81, I think. 81. My maths might be wrong, though. But he 81. Had, yeah, so he had 81. Can you imagine being a human being and 80 odd people come and try and counsel you, try and come and appease you to make a different decision? Have you ever been in that situation? I'm lucky if I even have one person saying to me, are you sure that's the right decision? <laughs> Let alone 80, you know, how merciful is God that he saw it fit to send <laughs> 80 priests to this king who had been loved, had been well revered and respected. How merciful is God, even at times. So, you know, when I'm reading the story of Isaiah and what he did, I just think for all the things that he did and the way in which he behaved, God still wanted to show him mercy, still wanted to take the opportunity to give him a chance to right his wrongs. But, so, but, yeah, um, to, go on, sorry. Then he could have, he could have um, um, based on his popularity before, um, so what he would, one would think that he may think that these priests were out of order. And he was king, so who were they to stop him? Yes, potentially. However, tell me, when he was king, in the hierarchy of the society, at what point was a king more senior than a priest? Maybe he wasn't seeing it that way, no. We, we are seeing both sides of the picture, that's what happened. Mm -hmm. We are seeing both sides, but he wasn't seeing it that way. All along, God was with him. We have another story we saw. We did the same thing, but um, all along, God was with him. We're not thinking that God would not be with him this time. We have this thing happening all the time. We, in our present life, we have that happening. Okay. When, uh, when people are in, in what you call superpower, they think that they have all the, the power and you have advisors telling him what to do, but they go against it. And these were the advisors. And he figured that um, he was the one who was giving the orders all the time, um, except when they have um, the, the temple thing. And you figure, well, if God has been with me all the time, there's no thing. We have a few instances. There's nothing of me going in. I will not go into the most holy place. I'll go into the holy place to offer sacrifice. And I, I don't 
I don't see. I, I'm sure that you have heard, I don't see nothing wrong with this. Is that you're telling me you don't see anything wrong with that, Brother Willow? No, no. I, I said people people normally say, I don't see anything wrong with this. So okay, that yeah. might have been a statement. I don't see anything wrong with me going in once to offer sacrifice. See, so, okay, let's take it back a step. <laughs> When you think about leadership, which is what the lesson is about this week, wow. when it's talking about the crisis of leadership, whose leadership is it pulling into question? Who, where is the crisis in this leadership? The crisis comes after. Yes. After the, from, but, here, from here onward. But f as though I'm sure we've all had work experiences where we've worked for a manager or we've worked for a senior leadership team of an organization and we've been like what are they thinking what are they doing are they making right choices are they doing what's best for the organization have we all had that experience mm -hmm. we all relate to that feeling yeah. so I think here King Uzziah did he do something that his advisors would have recommended him to do it's unlikely even leaders can make poor decisions and this in this instance his poor decision making led to a conversion experience for isaiah uh, which is what we learned about in the lesson as well but more importantly a crisis in real times with the assyrians coming in you know this, we're talking about historical events that actually took place here so the assyrians coming in the crisis of leadership in judah we learn all about what the impact of king Uzziah's choices were However, even because we are leaders, so for anyone that's ever been a manager or a business owner or a business leader, because you are a leader does not mean that your opinion or your um, ideas supersede that of the rest of the people. What makes a good leader? If I was to ask you, what makes a good manager? What makes a good leader? What would you guys say? One who listens. Um, one who listens. Go on, sorry. I think you have to be careful of who puts you in position <laughs> and because it's a bit like what's happening now that you god is the one who allowed him to be in the position that he's in and so as with an organization you need to follow the protocol you cannot undermine the management yes, yes. and when you undermine there are consequences mm -hmm. Thank and you. that's what's happened with him. Indeed. Clearly, it, there was a protocol and he needs to go to God through the priest. You cannot mm. enter and put yourself first. A bit like what Trump is actually doing. Yes, yes. All in all, <laughs> you need to follow protocol for your own safety and for the safety of your, your nation. Mm. Thank you, Sister Dorothy. Anyone else? Any other ideas about what makes a good leader? What makes a good manager? So we've heard someone who listens, someone who follows protocol, yeah. someone who respects the chain of command. Yes, Brother Monty. You have to involve your workforce, really. Oh yeah, yeah. Someone who involves our workforce. Brother Monty, you said that without moving your lips. <laughs> I was going to say that a, a good leader can also delegate. Yeah, and God uh, um, puts into place the protocols that Dorothy was talking about. You have religious uh, uh, rituals practices, as in a temple, which were down to the priests. Um, the king would lead his people, but also follow the directives given by God. He's a man of God, and what the king was trying to do was to do become a jack of all trades, trying to do everything what he's not supposed to do. So he was crossing boundaries, which were clearly laid out from the beginning. At the moment he did that, it all went wrong. Thank you, Brother Monty. You know, we see that all the hard work that God had done in building Uzziah's kingdom, in supporting him and helping him, helping him fight his enemies, and helping him to prosper and be successful, we see that as soon as Uzziah made the free will choice so this was a free choice that he made of his own accord no one told him he made the choice to go against god's will and go against against god's decision what were the repercussions of that so someone shouted out earlier but let's recap what were the repercussions of Uzziah's decisions 
what happened to him in the temple after the priests had tried to appease him? He had um, leprosy. Leprosy. Thank you, Sister Scarlet. Where was the leprosy? Does that have interest? In his forehead. Why is that significant, do you think? Or because do you think that's his thinking. That's how we think. Yeah. And we say that our, our character is contained in our frontal lobe, don't yeah. we? Are we talk about the seal of God being where? Yes, in, in the forest. forest. So we see all these instances in the Bible where when we are unpacking prophecy and we're unpicking symbolism, we see it repeated again and again and again. And all we have mm -hmm. to be paying attention. So we see mm -hmm. the leprosy strikes him in the forehead. And mm -hmm. what happens to him? He was isolated. He, he ends up being banished and isolated. Yeah. Now even in leprosy, even getting a leprosy, I feel like God was merciful towards him because God could have struck him down, mm -hmm. could have ended his life, but was still showed him mercy and gave him the opportunity to repent. repent. But he didn't. He was too proud. And that tells me, shows me how Lucifer started in heaven. What do you mean by that? What do you mean by that, Sister Scarlett? Tell us more about what you mean. Yeah, because um, he, because God prospered him, he wanted to take over. Lucifer was the same because of his beauty and his position. He wanted to be like God and to take over. Thank you. You know, we see this theme again, often throughout the Bible, where we see traits and behaviors that are against what God would have for us. And then we see again, traits and behaviors regards what God would want us to be more like. Now let's look at what um, the ultimate actions of King Uzziah. So yes, he, this is the kind of king that he was. And as his demise came around and as he passed away, so in the year of his death, that's where our lesson picks up the story of what happened to Isaiah. Now, reading the experience of what Uzziah, um, of what Isaiah, sorry, had in this vision, in this interaction with God, it's so powerful. I'm hoping we'll have enough time to cover it. But for me, I'm seeing, a I said, reference this earlier, I see a conversion experience for Isaiah and I'll tell you why. So, I'm assuming that we're all familiar with the literature works of Steps to Christ. Even if we haven't read it, we're familiar. And there are some defined steps for us getting to a place where we are experiencing God. So step one, any ideas of what that might be? We see God. So step one, we see God. However he may be presented to us, we see him. Mm -hmm. Step two is through seeing God, and God revealing himself to us, we then see ourselves in a more realistic lens through a more appropriate lens. And a lot of our own characteristics are brought to the fore and we see that for ourselves. Then when we see ourselves, that's what leads us to repent. Then that leads to confession. And then that leads to us receiving God or then hearing the voice of the Lord. And then last of all, surrendering or doing what God's will. So mm. if we break that down and look at the story today, we see that what happened to Isaiah? Tell me about what happened to him in, in his vision. What, what, what was his experience? He saw God. He saw God. Now, if we look at other biblical examples, who else has seen God? Shout out anyone that you can think of. Mm. Saul, what was Saul's experience before he became Paul? He was struck down on the Damascus Road. Yeah, and he saw he saw Jesus. You know, yeah. very few, um, very few of us can actually say right now, or oh, I've had the chance to see God with my own eyes and my own retinas. My corneas have laid eyes upon God. Very few people can say that, but we have examples in the Bible where that has happened. So we've got Saul. What about the thief on the cross? Yeah. He saw God and was converted and had an opportunity to, um, had an opportunity to uh, be converted and go through that experience. Anyone else that you can think of that had an immediate conversion experience when seeing God? 
looking at the story of Isaiah, he, he volunteered to serve in the Lord, but this was his ultimate calling. There was an actual specific task that yeah. he was actually called to do. So it was a little bit more than he, he had been in communion with God, but he hadn't got a, a specific task to lead out on. And the yeah. death of Uzziah was that moment for him. Yes, thank you, Sister Dorothy. You know, if we look at our Isaiah chapter six, which is where our study is taken from, so I'm gonna read it through with you and we will talk a bit more about this conversion experience. So in the year that, Lord, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. So this is the opportunity for Isaiah to see God in this vision. We don't know where this vision happened. We don't know how it happened or when it happened. And then in the vision, Isaiah sees um, in verse two, above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. What do you think is the importance of covering face and covering feet? Why is that referenced? Reverence to God. Yes, thank you, Sister Scarlett. You know, we see many cultures around the world where feet and heads being covered. So I, I'm, I was Sikh before I converted to Christianity. And when you go and worship in the temple, you cover your head and you take your shoes off and you go and you make sure you're in some temples they have foot washing before you actually go up to sit because having unclean feet or having an uncovered head is a sign of disrespect mm -hmm. so that's sign of reverence verse three we go on to read and one called to another and said holy 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 is the lord of hosts the whole earth is full of his glory why do you think they said holy three times I'm going to quote a politician. Some of you may know him. And I'm going to give you a, a, a snippet of his speech. Education, education, education. <laughs> Who am I talking about? Boris Johnson. Is it Boris this, Johnson? That was Tony Blair in the 90s. Oh, yeah. That was the speech that won him. That's the speech that won his votes to be prime minister. Mm. What are we seeing? Holy, holy, holy. So there's two reasons why there's three times we're saying holy, holy, holy. So one is the power of three. And the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. And the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Sister Scarlett. So we see here that they're addressing each member of the Godhead. Holy, holy, holy. Holy Father, Holy Son, Holy Spirit. But we also see that that repetition of three is so powerful, it's even used today. It was used by all many famous orators throughout history. It's used today by uh, people that write speeches for politicians. When you read and you look at, even in the Bible, there's the, there's the rule of three. So when we look at the 10 commandments, we look at the seventh day, remember the seventh day, hallow the seventh day, keep the seventh day holy. We see that repetition of three throughout and it's important to reinforce the message so then verse four it goes on to say and the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called and the house was filled with smoke what is that signifying the presence of god you know sister scarlet thank you so much you are getting three gold stars for your efforts today <laughs> Oh dear. <laughs> so we see the house is filled with smoke the presence of god and what happens so this is the conversion experience isaiah is seeing god and what is isaiah's first response verse five what's it say it says and i said woe is me for i am lost for i am a man of unclean lips and i dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the king the lord of hosts <coughs> What is happening here to Isaiah? Mm. Have you ever gone to a party and felt like you've been underdressed or overdressed? Mm -hmm. You know, this is what Isaiah is experiencing. He's experiencing God's holiness, God's awesomeness, God's presence. And in that very same moment, he's recognizing his own 
unholiness, his own sinfulness and uncleanness in the presence of God. And this is what happens in the conversion experience. You see God, then you see yourself. Seeing the image of perfection, creation, as things were meant to be, you recognize your own flaws, your own deficits, everything you are missing. And then it goes on to say in verse six, then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. Verse seven, and he touched my mouth and said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sins atoned for. Pardon me, and your sins atoned for. Tell me, what do we think is happening here? What is the, um, what is the importance of the burning coal? Burning coal is the, um, the purging of sin. It's a recognition of who you are. And the fact that he's said, woe is me, he's now admitting his guilt, his sinful nature. He's now being cleansed of that nature. Yeah. It, or it's been recognized that he's, he's um, saying well about, about himself. So the fact he's been recognized, he's now being touched to say, okay, you're clean. Thank you. Can someone look up Luke chapter 6, verse 45 for me, please? Luke chapter 6, verse 45. You know, when Isaiah calls out, whoa, I am undone. What's that word undone mean? Like, we don't use it in common vernacular today. But if I was to ask you for a synonym or another way to describe that word, what are some of the words that you may use? Exposed. Yes. Any other ideas? I'll give you a few. I might have looked some up last night while I was preparing. Um, ruined, destroyed, distraught, troubled. So when we replace that, whoa, I am ruined. Whoa, I am destroyed. Whoa, I am troubled. You know, we see the intensity with which Isaiah is putting forth his own desire to repent and confess. He's recognizing straight away, I'm not worthy, I need help, I'm in trouble, I am not in the place that I need to be to receive this message, I'm not worthy to be in the presence of God, I need you to do something straight away. Who's got Luke 6 verse 45 for me? Uh, I'll go yeah. there. Please read it out, Horatio. Sorry, Donald. Uh, yes, it says, a good man out of the good treasures of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasures of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaketh. Mm. Wow. So, talk to me about lips. <laughs> let's think about lips so we see in this story i have unclean lips not i have unclean thoughts i have an unclean mind i have unclean words i have unclean lips and then isaiah goes on to say i dwell in the land amongst people with unclean lips our text that horatio just read for us what is that telling us Well, the, the thoughts are unclean, so therefore the speech is unclean. Yeah. And, you know, the, um, we, <coughs> Jesus tells us that the um, abundance of a man's heart is spoken through his mouth, right? It's spoken through his lips. You can't hide the character and the kind of person that you are. So in your heart, you can't be one thing, and through your lips, you can't be saying another thing. The mm -hmm. lips will always belie the heart of a human being, of yeah. a man, right? And so what we're seeing here is that Isaiah, once again, is putting forth his inability to fix this situation on his own. He's surrendering everything to God and saying, not only am I distraught, not only am I undone, not only am I ruined and troubled, but I have, I am incapable because my heart and my lips are connected and they are unclean. Mm. So right now, God, you want to speak to me. You want me to do something. You are giving me a vision. We're in a crisis of leadership. The king has just died and you've come to me. I've got this vision and I can't, I can't handle it. I can't do it. Mm. I don't have what it takes to get me through this message. 
So what does God do? What happens? We see that the purging fire of the coal, we see fire regularly used throughout the Bible as a symbol of cleansing, as a symbol of sacrifice, as a symbol from God, as a way of making things new. So we see that the, the, the lips are purged and cleansed with the coal and they're put directly back onto the lips, which is where all the unclean things are coming from, right? Mm -hmm. So then let's look at the experience of repentance. So how long, out of interest, does God make Isaiah wait between his declaration of uncleanness and his ability to cleanse him? Is there a period of probation? Oh, Is there shit. a you do this and I'll do this trade-off? How many of us at work have a three month probation, six month probation when we start a job? Doesn't happen, does it? <laughs> right now, Isaiah's in his interview. He's already said, I don't have the skills to do this job. Does God say, right, I'm gonna put you on probation and give you some training for the next six months. We'll see how it goes. Mm. No. How awesome is our God straight away without mm. even Isaiah knowing what the answer is, without him even recognizing what help he needs, God fixes the problem straight away. And then God goes straight in for the kill, straight in for the mission. So basically I've dealt with your problem, no more drama, next mission. So verse eight in Isaiah six, it reads, Lord, and I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here am I, send me. You know, that desire, that passion, you know, how, you know, how regularly, before you even understood Isaiah, before you even knew what the story of Isaiah was, if you were new to um, the faith, how many of you heard that text quoted by pastors as a desire to show you to be willing for ministry, willing for mission work, whatever it might be? You know, when I think about um, the journey of repentance for Isaiah, I think about um, how gracious, how amazing God has been. But I think about, you know, John the Baptist and Jesus in their ministry, the first thing they commissioned people to do was to repent, to prepare mm -hmm. themselves, to be ready. You know, we read in Matthew 4, and by all means, you can reference this in your own time, Matthew 4, 17. As soon as Jesus has gone through the 40 days of wilderness and mm -hmm. the trials and temptations of Satan, the first thing he asked us to do is repent. So, you know, if we are reflecting right now in our own lives as to why we may be struggling, why we're not able to see ourselves through this crisis that we're going through, the issues that are happening politically, some of the things that are preventing us from accessing the support and the help and the commission of God, could be some of those things. Now, I don't know. <clears throat> and then... Um, when we see um, Isaiah's willingness, he is ready to go straight away. He wants to go straight away. What are our thoughts on that? Um, my thoughts on that is that he was willing to do it, to do what God wants him to do. And God is the person like this. He doesn't let anybody do something and don't help them. He's always there to help them. Once he sends you, he will help you to carry out your um, duties. Thank you. You know, what I find interesting in this passage is God asked the question. Is he really asking the question, who will go? Does he really not know who's going to go? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> he always knew Isaiah was going, whether Isaiah knew it or not. But why did he ask Isaiah who will go? He saw the willingness in his heart. He was trying to give Isaiah free choice, free will, right? Free choice. It's your decision. I'm asking you, will you go? I know you're going to, but I'm asking you, will you go? So that when you're on this mission for me, however hard, however tough it is, you can say in your heart of hearts, I wanted to go. I chose this. Not God made me. Not God forced me. Not God bullied me but I chose, I wanted this. 
Aya, please, can you get down, darling? I need to finish this lesson. Thank you. So then when we learn about Isaiah's response, let's think about some of the other prophets in the Bible who were given a special commission. Who are some of the prophets that come to mind when we think about God's special work, special commission at different times in the Bible? Jonah was Jonah. Yeah. How ready was Jonah? <laughs> Anyone else? Anyone else that we can think oh, of? Dear, oh dear. Yeah. Oh, what dear. about Moses? How ready was Moses? How many excuses did Moses come out with? <laughs> oh, I don't have any words. Oh, I can't do it. Oh, I was banished. Oh, I can't go back. I killed someone. Oh, no, I can't possibly go. Yeah. <laughs> so let's think about Isaiah's willingness, Isaiah's readiness to take on this special commission. And you know, the last couple of points that I want us to address, because I know we've only got a few minutes left and before I take any final thoughts from the audience, is um, when we think about hearing the voice of God and being ready for that commission and taking the opportunity to do God's work. I mm. think when we think about Isaiah's experience, the mission that he had was tricky. You know, if we look in the Bible at the, the text that we were just reading in, I, in Isaiah 6, the message was actually quite difficult because God said to him, and he said, go and say this to people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their eyes heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. You know, that message in itself is quite cryptic. It's not very black and white. It's not very plain. It is uh, almost like a parable, very similar to the way in which Jesus taught people. Do we agree, disagree? What are our thoughts? Um... The message in itself is quite tricky. To go and say that to people in times of crisis, rather than it being very black and white, here, call this number for help. Here, go and see this man, he will comfort you. What Isaiah is saying to people is, um, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. It's almost a riddle. Is it not? Yeah. What we are learning about is God sometimes gives us things to do that we don't always understand. Sometimes he gives us missions to go on. He gives us work to do that we feel like we're not ready for. We don't understand it. We are ill-prepared. And you know what? In all honesty, we probably are. But isn't it great that God is the one that equips us to do these things? God is the one that has all power all strength, all ability. We can't achieve anything through ourselves. And this is what Isaiah experiences in this instance. He recognizes he can't do it by himself. He can only do it with God's help, God's cleansing, God's support, God's guidance. And you know, my last question to you guys before we close is gonna be thinking about the lesson, reflecting on the times that we're living in at the moment. What is gonna be the one takeaway from this week's lesson? I would love for everybody to be able to shout out an answer in the last couple of minutes. Allow the Holy Spirit to lead you. Thank you, Sister Jean. Two gold stars for you. <laughs> no matter what you hear, no matter what you see, return to the word of God, because that is the sure directive that we can follow. Mm. Thank you, Brother Monty. You get an A+. Plus. <laughs> I'll send you a gold star on the post. <laughs> be, ready at all be ready at all times. Yes, Brother Donald, you know that's very true, especially right now. You know, I think when we went into lockdown, everyone was like, oh, we're living in end times, we're living in end times, we're a year later, we're still living in end times. You know, how are we using this message to keep us motivated? Are we prepared? Are we ready? Thank you, Brother Donald. Any other thoughts, um, any other takeaways? Yes, God will make you ready. Thank you, Sister Marla. Mm -hmm. Any other takeaways? Our determination to hold on. Thank you, Sister Scarlett. 
Any other last minute thoughts before we close? Be faithful. Thank you, Sister Jean. You know, I, when I first read the Bible, Isaiah was the book that really spoke to me. It's so poetic. It's so, the image and the language is so rich that I think the lessons of Isaiah can help. You know, we quote them. Our Bible text for today was taken from there. I think there's so much that we can learn from, the, from this book uh, when it comes to equipping us and helping us be ready. I hope that this lesson has been enriching for you. And I pray that you will continue to study the, the book of Isaiah and this message. I feel like we've only skimmed the surface this week, but bless you in the rest of the week. And thank you so much for taking part. Thank Amen. You. Amen. Amen. Amen, church. Amen. 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 We thank the Lord. We we praise God and we thank God that He has allowed us to to hear His words through His chosen vessel on this Sabbath day. Thank you very much, Suki, for making yourself available. Um, keep your phone near you um, for the next call, which will no doubt be coming in the very near future. In the very near future. Thank you very much, Suki. And at this time, we will have our mission report video. Getting an Adventist education in Ukraine when it was under the control of the Soviet Union was not just difficult, it was impossible. The city of Bucha was no exception. But now, an Adventist school is providing holistic education to the community. This is the first such project in the city of Bucha. If we take into account the history of Ukraine, then we have the effects of an atheistic past. We do not have many private schools in Ukraine in general. In 2015, the Academy of Wisdom Adventist School opened its doors in Bucha with just eight students. After much prayer and hard work from dedicated teachers and workers, the school has grown to almost 200 students. More than half of the students in our school do not belong to Adventist families. This is our opportunity to witness to them. The children learn to pray and read the Bible, and they share this with their parents. We have many instances where parents approach us and thank us for having such a special project because they see the changes in their children's behavior. This is because we are integrating the Christian worldview into all the subjects taught in our school. The Academy of Wisdom is not only a great witnessing tool in the community, but it's also an answer to prayer for many of the Adventist believers in the area. For many years, their children did not have access to Christian education. Students like Sophia were so happy to have a school where they could learn more about Jesus. I graduated from elementary school and was in a public school for a while, so now I feel the difference. I am very grateful to God that I have the opportunity to study in a Christian school. The morning devotionals with teachers on spiritual topics, praying together, all this helps a lot in my spiritual growth. Sophia is studying for baptism now and hopes to continue the rest of her education at the Academy of Wisdom. But there is one problem that may make it difficult for students like Sophia to get the Christian education they desperately want. This project is developing very quickly, and the only reason that currently limits this development is the lack of space. In fact, at the moment we have a great need for premises. Another 70 parents could not send their children to our school due to the fact that we just could not take them. We need support from you, dear brothers and sisters, and we thank you very much for your support because it will give us the opportunity to build a new room. A new building will create the space they need to continue spreading the gospel to all of the families wanting a Christian education in Bucha. Then even more students like Sophia can experience how exciting a relationship with Jesus truly is. 
please pray for the Academy of Wisdom Adventist School in Ukraine that is spreading the good news of the gospel to dozens of students every day. Consider supporting the school through this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering so they can build the room they need to serve their community. Thank you for your dedication and prayer for mission around the world. Again, once again, you know, each week I'm always encouraging us to so continue to support the church basically with our tithes and offerings. Just before we have our closing hymn, just want to say shout out to my mother. Hi, mom. Good to see you appearing as yourself today. That's all I should say. And we'll have our closing hymn. Our closing hymn, hymn 327. I would rather have Jesus. One, two. silver or gold I'd rather be his than have riches untold I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands I'd rather be led by his name Than to be the king of a vast domain Or be held in sin's dread sway I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords
this old world of hope today. This old world of hope today. Hey, hey. This old world of hope today. thankful to you for your good message through your word that we've received this morning and lord as we continue through the sabbath day we just ask that you the holy spirit will continue to minister our needs lord you know the the needs of our hearts even more than we know ourselves and so lord we approach you with our hands open wide asking lord that you would fill us with our cups to overrunning and may we say that it was good to be in the house of the lord on this sabbath day we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Sabbath school is dismissed at 12 o'clock on the dot. Whoa. Mm. Congratulations. Amen. <laughs>